bigger, please? Bit bigger. Um, let me see if I can do this. So I just had the Windows 10 upgrade happen to me, so I'm just trying to figure out, figure out exactly where everything's gone exactly. at the moment. I think that's about as much as we're going to fit on the screen with, with this. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to present um, Eclipse and the counterclockwise plugin, which is my personal preferred uh, uh, closure editing environment. And I'll show you a few of the sort of workflow things that I that I do that I find that I find convenient. Uh, I'm not saying it's the best environment, but I quite like Eclipse with counterclockwise for two reasons. One, I do quite a bit of Java work, and for me, I find it's quite handy to have closure and Java all running together in the same IDE. And the second thing is I'm a big fan of open source, so this is obviously the, the leading open source uh, job uh, ID environment. So uh, you know, that's, that's the reason that I've, that's drew, drawn me to a and I've sort of stayed with it for most of the time I've been uh, using Closure. Um, so I'll just do a quick walkthrough. Who's familiar with Eclipse here? Okay, a few. Um, I, th I think it's it's a fairly standard idea. I don't know IntelliJ so well, but I understand a lot of things are fairly similar. So we've got, basically we have a, a nice package explorer at the side, which has all the different projects. You can open projects, close projects, explore all the different files and the directories within the projects. It's got all of the standard Java features. So these are Java packages, Java classes, all of the things you'd expect to a Java IDE. What the counterclockwise does is it transforms this and gives it the extra closure features. So you can see closure files and closure, you know, with, with, with closure editors. So this is this is a closure editor point. You know, with all the syntax highlighting, it's got the uh, rainbow parentheses. Um, it's got um, auto completion functionality. It's got um, documentation. So if you put you, if you do the mouse over, it will give you the documentation on all of the on all of the things. It has a, on this side, it has a namespace browser. So everything which is defined in the current, in the current namespace that you're browsing, you can basically see all of these definitions and, and just jump straight to where they are in the source code, which is often quite a good way to sort of find your way around, uh, around, around, uh, around a namespace. And of course it has, um, you know, alongside a few other windows you may find useful, it has a REPL view. So the REPL is just a simple split screen window. You have the, the output in this part, and you have the code here. So, you know, it's, you know normal closure repl with syntax highlighting. It's got, you know, you can go backwards and forwards on previous commands. Um, it has PowerEdit. So, if you're doing, um, you can you can quickly select entire blocks. You can take an element, you can raise that 34 to the level above, so you just get 30, 48, all the, all the standard sort of power edit commands. I believe that most of the command keystrokes are actually the same as in Emacs or similar to what's in Emacs, so it should be relatively familiar to anyone who's, um, uh, who's, used, who's used power edit. So I think it basically covers most of the things you want out of a, a, a closure workbench and an, an IDA. One thing that I created, which I found quite useful, is um, a little tool called CLJUnit, which actually does JUnit integration for Clojure. So what it actually does is it scans the Clojure namespace, it picks up anything which has been defined with a def test in Clojure, and it integrates that into the JUnit system. So I thought I'd run a quick demo of that, but this is this is the Clisk project, which is my little uh, uh, fun image generation library. Um, what I can actually do is I can actually just run this as a JUnit test. Now, what it's going to do in a second? Hopefully. Okay, so I think it's probably just downloading something from Maven or something, something silly like that at the moment.
Okay, there we are. So what it's what it's done is it's um, it's got this high level test suite, but what it's done is it's actually picked out all of the different uh, test functions in the in the in the test files and basically ran it as if it, as a JUnit test. So you can see all the results and the timings. So it's actually using Eclipse's standard JUnit facility. So this is something I just found useful because I quite like to be able to run the tests. And of course, if you've got Java JUnit tests, it runs them all together. So it's just quite a nice way of integrating. And the same tests obviously will run with Maven if you're using JUnit integration or, 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 or line test. So I know I found that quite useful. The one thing I haven't. Can you show an example of the test? Like yeah, the sure. So I use I tend to use the Maven layout. I find it's I find it's, it's convenient, particularly when you work on Java code as well. Um, so I have the uh, test closure. I have a test colors. Okay. So I'm testing some Java colors. I'm testing that. So it's a def test. Who's familiar with closure test? Most. So. Okay. So closure test is basically unit. A unit testing library. It's pretty much. I think it's part of the core closure distribution uh, now. So um, you know, you get it basically out of the box. I'd say it's fairly primitive. It does some simple assertions. Um, it's good for just writing quick unit tests, and it's quite well understood and, and standard. And you basically you basically write a def test. So in this case, it's test basic colors. You can you can give a little little mini test suite inside if you wanted just to be able to um, you know break up the test into smaller subcomponents. And then it has this is macro which um, just is asserting that the result of some expression is going to be true. And in this case I want it to be true that um, white is 1.0, 1.0, 1.0 and black is 0 .0, 0 .0, 0 0.0, Yeah so that's the definition of the of the, sort of the, the, the RGB colour vectors. Um, and it's basically you just write a normal closure namespace, a test namespace, you write your def tests and then um, either CLJ unit or line test or maven test with the maven closure plugin will just pick up those tests and run them all as one, as one integrated suite. Uh, is it possible to run a single test? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so you can... Uh, Let me just test. I think it's a function. Um, okay, so there's a run all tests. Which runs everything. There is a um, run tests with a namespace. So if I just want to test a particular namespace, you can say just run the test in a particular namespace, which is kind of useful if you've got a big source file and you just want to test some sub-module. Um, now I don't actually know whether you can run a single test, but let's see what test color actually is. I think I just switched the namespace. One second, Chris. Dot test core. Maybe this isn't loaded. Okay, yeah. So I, basically, because the test got run in a separate process when I was running the J unit test, it hadn't actually loaded this namespace. So I switched into the namespace, and it hadn't actually loaded the definition to that point. Um, so it's an object. I have no idea actually what it is. Uh, There is probably a way. Uh, probably if you inspect that object, you can figure out how to run it. And it, it ultimately, I think down at its heart, it's just a function uh, that's basically getting called by the test framework. I'm not exactly sure how it's wrapped up. So they've wrapped it up in some kind of, in some kind of object, uh, object here. So, but yes, I think you, sh you should be able to do that if you, if you want to. The other thing I found quite useful is um, on the testing front is test.check. And this is quite a nice tool. It's, it does generative testing. So rather than just giving the specific cases you want to test, 
you give it a set of properties that you want to be true, so assertions, and, a, and some generators. So the generators actually generate your test cases. So you can generate vectors of different sizes, random strings, uh, random maps of random strings, uh, you know, and, and, and nest these generators together to actually build quite complicated random data structures. And what this will do is, A, it will give your, you, it'll mean you don't have to manually create all these test cases, it'll go and create a thousand or ten thousand or how many of these you want it to run. And the other thing it does quite clever is shrinking. So if it finds a test failure, it will then shrink the case that failed and while it still fails, so it tries to find the smallest possible failing test, which is actually quite a cool feature because you don't necessarily want a, a 9,000 line test case. You want to find the smallest test case which actually demonstrates the failing behaviour. Um, so I'm not using this library, but it's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a nice testing method. And if, you, if you're smart using generators, you can actually get better test coverage with fewer lines of code because you can how do you decide what assertions to write? Because fundamentally, your assertions are going to be validating, are going to be somewhat subject to the, the input, right? I mean, certainly, uh, how does it, I mean, how does someone understand how you do that? So, okay, so I'm not a big proponent of test-driven development. I tend to write my code and then write a test. Right. And I tend to write tests for things that I think I'm going to break later. Yeah? So, first of all, I... I'll write some tests which validate that something is working. Yeah, something, anything at all. If something's working, then you know it's mostly right. Then I'll write a test for some edge cases where I think if I change the code, then maybe the case of an empty list might not work. Yeah, so I try and write a couple of test cases around those corner, corner points. And I write more tests if I think it's code that I'm likely to refactor. Because I find that that's actually one of the challenges testing closure code is whenever you're doing refactoring, you haven't got a type checker to, to cover yourself. And you'll often find you introduce bugs when you're refactoring. So I write more tests when I think I'm going to do that. I'm, I say I'm not a big TDD. No, that's OK. Types. I mean, it's more about, I'm just more curious about like, what the assertions would look like. Because ultimately, I mean, what you're basically stating is like you know what you're looking for, right? And you're leaving it to the test generator. As I understand it, you're leaving it to the test generator to sort of do the, the dirty work as far as yeah. as far as uh, exercising your, your functions, right? Yeah. Let's see if I can find an example. Um, Okay, yeah. So this is this is a test in core.matrix using a test.check. And what it's doing is it's got this array generator, which is generating, uh, it's actually a nested generator. So there's a generator for doubles, so double numerical values. There's a generator for shapes of arrays, so it might be a two by three array or a, five, or a length five vector or a, 10 times 9 times 7 times 6, four dimensional array. So it generates shapes and increasingly large shapes as it, as, it, as, it, as, it, as, it, as it builds them. And then it's got another generator which, given a generator of shapes and a generator of array values, builds larger and larger arrays out of those shapes and values. Uh, so the array generator is basically this it's going to create larger and larger numerical matrices. And what I'm saying is for, and it's a so prop is the property, property testing. So for all arrays which are produced by this array generator, if the implementation supports that shape, so if, it hasn't, if it's got the wrong kind of shape, there's no point to testing it, but if, as long as it's, you want a condition on the, which, which things you want to actually test. But as long as the implementation supports that shape, I want to run this function, and I want to be sure that that function succeeds. Yeah, which, so, is a which is a test for that array. Of array instance. So can I see instance test? Um, yeah, instant test is. Um, that's hard for small screen. Instant test basically goes and runs a bunch of uh, separate assumptions. So 
test numeric assumptions, for example. There's a bunch of tests which are basically nested inside these functions which test various different sub properties of that, of that array. Yeah. Essentially, I've got a question about the workflow because now you're looking in the like, outline. Is there any way that you can go into the definition declaration of the, of the function? Like, go into it? So, you know, what I mean? Like, you, you, so you've got a function like numerical scholar tests. Is there a way that uh, you, you put? You mean, can you navigate? Yeah, you can navigate. Actually, like, the cursor goes straight to that. Um, you can navigate on this. Um, right. Can you, you, can't go can you navigate this? Hang on a sec. Uh, uh, I'm not sure there's a. I'm not sure there's a browse to, to be honest. Closure. Uh, oh, yeah. Navigate to definition F3. Is that going to work? Okay. It might be this is one of the things that doesn't work too well across namespaces. Okay, I don't know why that's I don't know why that's not working. Why now? It might, oh, it's probably because I haven't loaded it. Let's see if this works. Okay, that looks more promising, so I've actually got the dot strings and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Mike, what kind of uh, applications do you uh, do you implement with this with this workflow? Is it generally libraries or do you um, servers as well? Or? I, I do I do libraries. I do sort of web applications, full stack web applications, data processing code, machine learning code. Um, I was going to demo from a workflow perspective, just something on um, on uh, the way that I've set up um, uh, set up this to work for example so what I find is very helpful is to have little helper functions so this is like a, a, a rendering for it, it, it generated images I tend to write a little helper function that um, will actually display things or pop things up in a separate separate window so if I want to show a image which is generated by showing plotting the x and y values, yeah, it just opens up a little separate separate image. So I tend to like use these little side windows to uh, to, to display, but actually control everything from the REPL, yeah. So um, uh, let's see. so I'm I'm sort of using this as a. I use it as basically an interactive workbench as you're sort of doing experiments and trying to uh, and, and trying to build different kinds of uh, uh, kinds of tools. So what I'm generally doing is working at the REPL, and then when I found code that's useful, I'm going to pop pop it into a source file or into a, into a test case if I'm if I'm just testing testing things out. Um, and that's that's the way I find it is most helpful to work. And if you use things like um, the reloaded pattern or um, fig wheel, these kind of tools, and you can do that kind of that kind of work and have things going on in the background, and you know, restarting web servers and re recompiling JavaScript and things like that. So you know, once you've got it set up, it works quite nicely. Sometimes yeah. a few fiddly bits just getting it, getting it started. Uh, do you use debuggers? No, not really. Um, I don't. I think there is some debugger support in here, but you know, I find that generally it's easier to actually figure out what's going wrong with the, with tests rather than trying to step through a lot of code. Um, and I don't think there's debug support. I think there is some debug support. I think. Turn over if it actually supports breakpoints. I don't. Oh, I think it has got some support for debugging and breakpoints, but. Um, uh, I, I, I tend to 
tend to do it through tests and through uh, and through doing stuff in an exploratory manner, manner on the web pool. The other thing that's quite nice about this is it, it has both Lining and Maven integration, so you can use either of those to manage your projects, update dependencies, do all of these kind of things. From a workflow perspective, do you have a preference of Maven versus Lining? Um, I'm sort of indifferent. Um, I think that Maven's sometimes convenient if you're working with Java stuff because the tools are better. Um, so, if I think I'm going to be doing a lot of releasing and CI kind of stuff, I probably have a slight preference for using Maven. Um, on the other hand, Line is Line has some features and some tools and some plugins which are quite handy for like if you're doing fig wheel stuff um, in the, for, for specific closure things. Um, and also, Line is Line is people understand it better than the closure community. So you're more likely to get people, you're less likely to confuse people if you use uh, project.clj. Um, now I personally think Maven's actually not that bad. I know the pom.xmls are pretty verbose, but you know, it does, it does what it's meant to do. Yeah, and um, you know, in a way, lining it is just a nice, a pretty skin and a few extra features laid on top of the actual Maven underlying model. So I find them similar enough you can sort of inter interchange. Um, Closure itself, you actually have to use a pop.xml. Actually, that's the official closure core policy is that you know the closure contrib libraries have to have to be Maven managed. I think that's because of all their build systems and CI and, and that kind of thing. Do you ever get new features that you know, in kind of compromise? Is it an active, actively maintained and updated tool? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, it just it keeps on getting better every couple of months. Yeah, there's a guy called Lauren Petit who keeps on issuing new new releases. It's it's pretty good. I mean, I um, yeah, I find it does everything everything I, I've needed at least. And uh, you know, certainly if you're an Eclipse user, I think it's natural to use counterclockwise. Um, not saying it's better than all the other options, but you know, it's, it, it certainly it certainly works for me. Are there any alternatives? Uh, I mean, as far as the plugins go, counterclockwise. Not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, I think it's the only one from those. Does it give you any syntax warnings, for example, like keys or any school or something like that? Is how you can see your problem apps. Uh, what do you mean in terms of? So you got a tap there, up there, like problems, right? And then, oh, um, like, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, these okay. are Java warnings. Okay. Um, so, so you have something like I think it does. It does for things like if there's an error in lining and files, and certain 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 kinds of issues will will pop up. Um, I think it's more geared though for rather because the, the whole problem thing in Eclipse is more geared around build errors. Yeah, so compiler warnings, uh, um, configuration errors. Um, I find normally I'm working with a web pool rather than sort of doing the sort of build compile cycle. So does it support all of the um, native of those refactoring or some subset of them? Is there any refactoring support? Um, that is a good question. I don't think it's got much in the way of in the way of refactoring. I mean, it's got it's got the PowerEdit kind of refactoring. So one of the nice things about PowerEdit is there's got some very quick key presses to select and cut and move around large blocks of code. Um, I don't think it's got smart refactoring like you know pull out arguments and, 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 and that kind of thing. Although I think those things are quite quite hard to do in Closure in general anyway, because yeah. you know, obviously haven't got the types and you haven't like got changing them. a function name or something like that and then going through or changing out. A, a like a, a, a function um, definition. Yeah, like don't think it's like really got that. But this stuff's quite hard to do in Closure, yeah, because you can define your function name programmatically. So there's no actual way that you can write a, an editor which actually can support uh, total refactorings on Closure code. You know, you can always find ways of cheating the uh, 
to cheat using some dynamism to cheat it and you can have code break. So unlike in a language where everything's like completely defined and you can actually find out every single reference to a var, in closure you can't do that because you can dynamically create those references references to a var. So it's it's a little bit trickier. How do you handle a situation like that when you would need to make a change like that just to go through manually and kind of search and replace? Um, well, hopefully you've written at least one test that tests each code path. <laughs> so at least that's going to fail if you rename something and it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that's probably your number one defense. Um, you can do the, the usual search and replace stuff. Um, yeah, I generally try and pick good... Generally, try and pick good names in Clojure so you don't have to refactor too much because you know it, it, it is actually my bug, biggest bugbear in Clojure is refactoring is trickier than in in, in other in some other languages. Particularly when you've got a large code base and a lot of yeah. cross links. <coughs> like I always do something stupid, like you know change the name for change the name of a tag because I picked a bad name in the first place and then forget to update it in some other namespace it's assuming that this key is going to exist in, in, exist in this map and yeah. that's where a lot of the refactoring bugs I, I find come from. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well hope you found it interesting. Yeah.